Father Daniel Couture, and I would like to continue this talk on the opening our homes to the Sacred Heart, the second of a three-part series. We have spoken of the youth of Father Matteo Crowley. We have spoken of his discovering the picture of the Sacred Heart, which was the original painting that Garcia Moreno used for the consecration of Ecuador, a South American country, to the Sacred Heart in 1874. So let's continue our story of Garcia Moreno. So 1906, that earthquake in Chile, the picture of the Sacred Heart remains standing. The following months were so tiring for Father Mateo, he burnt himself out trying to restore everything, all the after earthquake effort that his health broke down. His superiors decided to send him on a break, on a sabbatical, go to Europe, visit the shrine, go to Paris Monial, go to Rome. <clears throat> That's what he did. <clears throat> so on June 1907, he sees Pius X. And by the way, he gave to Pope Pius X a copy of that painting, which St. Pius X kept in his bedroom until his death. August, he goes to Paris Le Monial, he is cured. And before going back to Chile, he makes a trip to the Holy Land, he spent a lot of time in Nazareth and in Bethany. And that's going to be part of the whole ceremony of the enthronement. The first area, the first place where he will start his crusade is going to be his own hometown in Valparaiso in Chile, 1908. The crusade starts. He explains it. He starts enthronements in homes. The results are spectacular. Conversions of, of Freemasons, conversions of enemies of the church, families reconciled, big fishes going back to, con to confession. One bishop said, I have not seen one man risen from the dead. I saw a whole graveyard rising from the dead. By 1911, in Chile alone, 120,000 families have done the enthronement in their homes. In 1913, the bishops of Chile asked St. Pius X, Pope Pius X, he was not yet canonized, for special blessings for the enthronement. There's a special indulgences for Chile. Two years later, Pope Benedict XV will extend that to the whole world. The crusade is starting. Father Matteo wants to advertise. He's from a family of bankers. They're well, they are well organized. So he needs some secretaries. He's not going to ask seminarians or nuns or brothers. He has an idea of genius, a Paulinian idea. He will take children, children which are little in the eyes of, of men, but great in the eyes of God. He will gather children as copists. First, he gave them a retreat, and then he would write a letter for bishops, archbishops, religious communities of men and women in five different languages, the languages that he knew. And he had a team of children copying the letters. They didn't even know what they were writing, but they knew how to copy the letter, and Father Matteo would sign. That's how the crusade of enthronement got out of, of, of Chile. And it had such an effect that there is still a letter. There were in the archives of the, uh, the enthronement, the, the organization of the enthronement in, in the US. There was a letter of 1913 sent to a bishop written by a child signed by Father Matteo. That letter was the start of the crusade in the U.S. God uses things that are not to confound those that are, as St. Paul says. Beginning of 1914, his superiors 
sent him to Europe for one year, they say, for one year. He will come back 40 years later. He's going to go to around the world in these 40 years. When he arrives in Paris, the war is just starting, the summer of 1914. One bishop says, I think this is the wrong moment to start this. You should go home. And Father Matteo replied, did Noah build the ark before the flood or after the flood? And he started his crusade. He will go from country to country. He'll spend 20 years in the countries of Europe. Popes after Pope give him his blessing, Benedict XV, Pius XI, Pius XII. And in his tour of Europe, sometimes he would give up to eight sermons per day. Crowds in convent, parishes. It was the devotion to the Sacred Heart, the, the, the doctrine of the, the, the Sacred Heart, as we will see in a moment, and it was the enthronement. This doctrine brought home through the enthronement. In 1927, he will go one step further. He will start the night adoration in the home. So the people involved in, in the enthronement wanted to do more for our Lord. A father was, was firing them up and they start night adoration, and many of them, it was all night adoration at home as a family. 1935, so after 21 years in, in uh, Europe, he goes to Asia. He'll spend five years in Asia, giving mostly retreats, Philippines, Japan, India, Indonesia, Sri Lanka, Malaysia. One of the themes that he gave to priests, one of his, the theme of his retreat also was qualis misa talis sacerdos. A priest will be what his mass is. If the priest celebrates mass in a truly holy manner, the priest will become a saint. 1940, he arrives in the U.S. He will spend four years in the U.S. 40 to 44. 1944, he crosses the border to Canada. He's going to go from coast to coast and doing this great crusade for the Feast of the Sacred Heart. And when he's in Quebec, he meets another apostle of the Sacred Heart, this time an OMI, Oblate of Mary Immaculate, Father Victor Lelievre. Father Lelievre's life is pretty much contemporary to Father Matteo. And Father Leliev was the great apostle of the Sacred Heart in pretty much the same lines as Father Matteo and promoting the Feast of the Sacred Heart. In 1951, Father Leliev had the Feast of the Sacred Heart celebrated in Quebec City and had an altar of repose on the Parliament of Quebec with the Prime Minister then, Maurice Duplessis. And there were 50,000 people present at this ceremony. That was the kind of thing Father Matteo liked. <clears throat> 1952, he gets sick. He has a number of heart attacks. He's in hospital. But even in the hospital, whether it's Montreal or Three Rivers, his hospital room becomes a, a very busy office. He writes letters and even writes books, even promoting this uh, enthronement of the Sacred Heart. In '56. His superiors bring him back to Valparaiso in Chile. He left in 1914, 52 years earlier. And on May 4th, 1960, he dies. He wrote towards the end of his life, or rather he said to a friend who came to see him in hospital, when I will be unable to preach anymore, I will write. And when I will be unable to write, I will pray. And when I will be unable to pray, I will continue to love in my suffering and to suffer with love. So that is Father Matteo Crowley, a great apostle of the Sacred Heart. And we don't have time to speak about it, but this, this crusade of consecrating homes to the Sacred Heart goes hand in hand with a devotion to the Immaculate Heart spreading throughout the world. Then in the books on Fatima by Brother Michael, there's the, an account of all this, this uh, 
the return of Our Lady, pilgrim statues going around the world in Spain, in Europe, in Rome, all over with hundreds of thousands of people. They go hand in hand. I told you the, the congregation of Father Mateos, the missionaries of the Sacred Heart, SSCC, which means SS, the most sacred hearts in plural, so the two hearts. Let's say a few words now on the doctrine of the Sacred Heart. We saw in the life of Father Matteo, we saw a, an application of the word of St. Paul, caritas Christi urget nos. The charity of Christ presseth us. It compels me. It crushes me it, to move. Come on, do something. <clears throat> The whole Catholic religion is based on this truth, Deus Caritas Est. God is charity. All the Catholic faith, when you think about it, can be connected, can be related to the love of God for us. Because what is to love? And we will apply this to God. If you, excuse me, if you think about what love is, what love does. To love is to give. When you love someone, you give something. You see children making friends, they will start giving gifts. God loves us. First thing he did was to create us. He gave us being. He gave us life. He made this extraordinary universe in which he reveals his wisdom, his power, his beauty, his, his infinite uh, uh, goodness. So love is to give. Love is to talk to. You talk to your friends. Husband and wife talk to each other. Well, God loves, so he will talk to us. That is called a revelation. To love is to become like the one we love. A mother plays with her little one on the floor. She will sit on the floor and play little, with little baby's toys, speak baby language with her little baby. Become like the one you love. When our Lord loves us, he became like us. That's the incarnation. He became one of us. To love is to forgive. There's no love without forgiveness. Because love is stronger than death and love is stronger than hurt. Love, is, love, true love is above even being hurt. We see that in marriage. We see that with friends. And Christian love extends that to even the love of enemies. Think of St. Stephen being stoned to death by the Jews and asking God to forgive them. And he converted Paul. Well, if love is to forgive, that is the mercy of God. Something which is, we could almost say, greater than God's charity because it's, charity is to create us, but to have mercy on us is to, as we say at Mass, to recreate us, like to, to start all over again a second time. To love is to give all. That's what marriage is. At the day of the marriages, one gives himself totally to his future spouse, and then the lady gives herself totally to her now husband. Well, that is the cross, the mystery of the cross, the whole mystery of redemption, the total gift. Our Lord said, there is no greater love than to lay down our lives for our friends. He did not only say it, he did it. He died on the cross. I have the power to lay down my life and the power to take it back. To love, continue, it's always, it's always uh, originating from the source of love. To love is to feed. First natural reaction, reflex of a mother is to feed a little newborn baby. 
to feed her children. When a mother hears her baby crying, she, she goes and, oh, it's feeding time. She will get up in the middle of the night to feed her baby. To love is to feed. That is the Holy Eucharist. That is the Mass. Eat my flesh, drink my blood. My flesh is food indeed. My blood is drink indeed. To love is to be together. Not just to be alike, but to live together, to be with our friends, to be with the one we love. That's marriage, that's friends, and that is sanctifying grace. God loves us. He wants to be with us. He who loves me will keep my commandment, and we will come and make our abode in him. So we will not just come to say hello, but we're going to move in. We're going to stay with him, make our abode, make our dwelling in him. And our, as our Lord said also in St. John, you know, abide in me and I in you. We have to be in him as he is in us. So every aspect of our holy Catholic religion originates from that infinite love of God. It's because God loves us that we are here, that he has forgiven us and that he gives us the sacraments, that he gives us the commandment. It's because he loves us that he gave us the commandment. If you love me as I love you, keep my commandments. That we have the credo. The credo is the history of the, the love of God in the temporal order. That's one aspect of the whole theology of love. I'd say it's one angle to look at the whole religion. Let's look at another angle. St. John says, chapter 1 of St. John, no one has ever seen God, but the Son of God who is in God, he made him visible. He revealed him to us. And remember at the Last Supper, the famous Last Supper, at the Last Supper when our Lord was talking and I need to leave you and I need to go back to my Father and I will send you the Holy Ghost and my Father. And our Lord was always speaking about his Father. And at one moment, uh, at one moment, uh, St. Philip, who was nearby, asked our Lord, but my Lord, show us the Father. That's all we need. You're always talking about the Father. The Father is everything for you. Just show us the Father. And Jesus says, Philip, I've been with you so long, three years. Philip is one of the very first ones. And you still don't know me? Don't you know that he who sees me sees my Father? So that's the sacred heart. That's what we have to understand. He who sees me sees my Father. Our Lord wants to, our, our Lord wants to, to enter into our lives because God wants to enter into our lives. And he who sees me sees my Father. It's interesting. In the gospel, we see the children. The children, when they heard Jesus speaking, when they saw his smile, when they saw him doing miracles, and when they saw him sitting down to have his little picnic with his apostle, the children would come and talk to him. And, and uh, there's one moment where there must have been, I don't know, 5, 10, 15 kids around our Lord, climbing on him like little kids do with their, their fathers or, or big brother. And, and the apostles were pulling them out, leave, kicking them, leave them alone, leave him alone, he needs a break. And Jesus says, Peter, just calm down. Let the children come to me, for the kingdom of God is like unto them. And unless you become like a little child, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. So children sensed that the heart of Jesus was something else. Sick people, of course, understood that this rabbi of Nazareth was different, was different. And even if the, the Pharisees and were, were, were trying to stop people going from, to Jesus, Jesus would go and cure the sick, the whole villages sometime. And he'd be good with the blind. He'd be good with the lepers. He would be good with, with anybody who was sick because he knows that suffering is his heart. Suffering is his heart. He would cure the bodies and then he would cure the souls. He would teach them his gospel, his, his uh, beatitude. So the sick people, we've all been to hospitals and you know in a hospital if a nurse or an employee in the hospital puts his heart into the work or is just doing the work for the job, 
we can see that. The way they, you need to push a wheelchair, the way they get somebody out of bed, a sick person. If it, is, it done, is it done with the heart? That's why even the enemies of the church in the days, be, in the days past, when they had to go to hospital because they too have to die, Freemasons or communists, they would usually choose Catholic hospitals because they knew that these nuns, they put their heart, they, they would take care of them like their mothers would do. Our Lord was good with those who were afflicted, those who were afflicted in their soul. Think of the widow of Naim, who's, who is a widow and whose only son had died. And when Jesus saw her, he must have thought of his mother, his own mother, who was a widow and who had only one son who would die soon. Jesus knew, knew Lazarus and he was well known in Jerusalem. He lived Bethany, just three kilometers away from Jerusalem. And he got to know him pretty early. We don't know too much how it started, but there was probably a, a time the, when the first time Jesus met Lazarus, he had only one sister in the house, it seems, and it was Martha. Mary was not there. She was not yet converted. And our Lord entered a home where one member of the household was causing grief, shame to the whole family. Our Lord knows what it is. He saw it with these, uh, these two who became his close friends, Lazarus and Martha. And what must he have told them? Just be patient, pray, pray. God is almighty and you keep praying, offer sacrifices. She will come back, she will come back. And one day Jesus was there and there were three. There were no longer two. Our Lord knows what it is to suffer in one's heart a betrayal, an abandonment, a, a broken home, an infidelity. Our Lord knows. But he says, he said to us, he says to us what he said then. He says, just pray, believe, offer it up, offer your pain, and it will fall back as graces on these souls which are causing you grief. So Jesus visited homes of people afflicted. He himself was there, according to tradition, when St. Joseph died. But the category that our Lord loved most, and for which he did the most, are the poor sinners. He died for them. That's all of us. He died for them. And what would he not do to save a sinner? I think Mary Magdalene is certainly one of the most beautiful stories beautiful soul. She, according to the gospel, she may be the very first one who understood the real mission of our Lord. Jesus had been doing miracles, had been preaching to crowds, having preaching the, the parables, the, the Sermon on the Mount, and crisscrossing, blessing homes. But all of a sudden, uh, one person understood when she heard that she had done some miracles, that he was reading, reading hearts, that he could forgive sin. Remember the man who was laid down, uh, who was brought down from the ceiling, that had opened, opened the roof and, and laid him down, brought him down on ropes because it was overcrowded. And Jesus cured him and Jesus forgave his sins. And the Jews were wondering, what? This man is forgiving sin. Only God can do that. And Jesus says, that's right. Only God can do that. I forgive you your sins. Take up your bed, get up and go. And that spread. This was near the Lake of Galilee. So that spread around the lake. And Magdala, Magdala is a little, little small village just on the southwest of the Lake of Galilee. Mary Magdalene. That's probably where she was hanging around. And she heard of this man who could read hearts and forgive sin. And she had a heavy heart. She had committed a lot of sins. 
She had never heard of confession, but she felt instinctively moved, drawn to find this man and fall at his feet. And that's what she did. Sometime later, she found him in a banquet and she just walked in uninvited, fell at his feet because she knew he was inviting her. And Jesus' heart must have vibrated, must have vibrated when, when he f saw Mary Magdalene at his feet. Finally, somebody understands my mission. I'm here to forgive her sins. Another one was the good thief on the cross. He had to pull on, his, the, on the hand, push on the feet, take a, a breath of air, turn his head, and by turning his head, the thorns were poking him in, in, in the head. And it was like electric shock whenever he moved his head and to speak. And he turned to his right and, this day, you will be with me in paradise. If you want to touch the heart of God, just kneel down and say sorry. Like the father of the prodigal son, he will run to you and grab you in his arms. That's the sacred heart. That's the sacred heart revealing the love of God the invisible God. We see God visible through the Sacred Heart of Jesus. And in these stories of the Gospel, we see that our Lord has chosen homes. He chose a home to came on earth, Nazareth. He spent 30 years in that home. As we have said, he had another home where there, was, there were friends, and that was Bethany near Jerusalem. And during the Holy Week, during the Holy Week, he would go and rest in Bethany. And another home was the Cenacle. It became the home of the church. The Blessed Sacrament, Pentecost, so many things took place in the Cenacle. And so our Lord wants to reign in homes. He wants to reign in homes. He wants, as he said to St. Margaret Mary, he wants the image of his heart to be exposed and honored, not just exposed, but honored in a place of honor. The Sacred Heart wounded. He appeared to St. Margaret Mary with the wound of the side, which we see on the Holy Shroud. The wound. He paid the price. We have been redeemed at a great price. I have suffered for you. I don't want you to forget. You are extremely dear to me. I, I, I have died for you. Don't forget. One time, Father Larkin, who was a successor of Father Matteo as in charge of the crusade of uh, enthronements. He, he was talking about the image of the Sacred Heart and he asked a child, why do we put thorns around his heart and why don't we have on the picture of the Sacred Heart thorns around his head like they, have, they were like it happened. And the child replied, that's because our sins hurt his heart more than his head. So we see, therefore, in the gospel that our Lord wants to enter in our lives. He wants to reign in our homes. He wants to reign on us. He wants to reign through us. He wants to reign over people of all conditions. He even walked into Pilate's palace, although he was brought there as a, as a prisoner. Nevertheless, as he said to St. Margaret Mary, the humiliations that he got in the palaces, now he wants princes and kings to kneel in front of him to atone for these. Men like Garcia Moreno, like King St. Louis, they have done that. And so this whole campaign of enthronement is to make reparations for the insults our Lord has received in the Passion that he's continuing to receive today. And also it, it is to extend his kingdom. He wants to reign over the whole world and he's not reigning over the whole world. So in the third part of the series, we will see the practical way to make our Lord reign in our homes. Thank you very much.